Good evening, and welcome to this webcast of the uh, Mesos de Vecchi Cardiovascular Journal. For those of you who have not yet done it, you can subscribe to the journal and receive it in a printed version, or you can always come to our website, journal.houstonmethodist.org, and enjoy the journal uh, online. Uh, the current issue of the journal is featuring uh, diseases of the aorta, and we we thought this was an important topic to do because um, as cardiologists and even cardiovascular care uh, professionals, we're good at many things we do. But one area that not everybody has expertise is managing diseases of the aorta, following patients with the disease, making decisions on when best to uh, intervene, and of course, uh, the interventions themselves, which in the last 10 years have progressed tremendously. So um, we're very proud of what we have here at Houston Methodist, and of course, my good friend and chairman of the Department of Cardiovascular uh, Surgery, Dr. Alan Lobsden, um, was good enough to volunteer as guest editor for this issue, and, and he put together a magnificent yeah. issue covering a lot of wonderful topics. And today, what we want to give you is just a, a taste of it, so that we encourage you to go <laughs> and actually Look, go to the journal itself, read the articles, and um, enjoy and get educated in some of these areas that have progressed so much in the last 10 years. So without much delay, I introduced uh, my good friend, Dr. Lomsden, sitting at my uh, left, and he will introduce some of the other participants today, and hopefully uh -huh. we'll have a wonderful hour where we can all learn something new about diseases of the aorta. Alan? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Quinones, but he's always known as Dr. Q for the rest of us, so you're going to have to be Dr. Q for the rest of the, the, rest of the evening. We were just laughing before we, we uh, introduced the guest uh, that Dr. Quinones, how long have you been he working here at Methodist? 45 years. 45 years, and so he and I were both at Baylor when this Baylor Methodist split occurred. He got fired, I just got demoted, so I'm kind of <laughs> one step ahead of you. But he's been here through, uh, through, the, through the DeBakey era, the Stanley Crawford era, so we're going to make you tell us some of those stories. You know, no article on the, on the order would be complete unless we heard some of these stories. So we'll, we'll come back to you with that. Let me introduce our exactly. guests, first of all. So let me introduce the people who are remote, first of all. Um, it, from joining us from Dallas is uh, Dr. John Knight. He's a professor of vascular surgery up at Baylor Dallas, and he wrote the article on dissection. So uh, welcome, John. Uh, people always say to us, you know, when we show nice pictures, what kind of imaging system do you have at Methodist? And I say, Dr. Ponraj Chinadre is the imaging system. And he makes it, Plum, I describe him as Ponraj Picasso. He works in imaging <laughs> the way Picasso works in oils. And so Ponraj really is going to talk to us about uh, imaging in the order. To my left is Dr. Marvin Atkins. He recently become appointed as the director of aortic therapy here at Methodist. And he'll tell us a little bit about his pathway. And then the far left base is Dr. Mohammed. Rahimi, who wrote the article on um, at ruptured aorta and the protocols. So, with that, let's go ahead and bring you in, Ponraj. Do you want to? I know you want to show some pictures first of all. Do you want to go ahead and share your screen and do that? Uh, sure, Dr. Lundstrom. Let me say a couple of words and then I'll sure. start my slide. So, thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Ponraj Sinchinadra. I have the great, great pleasure of working in Houston Methodist since 2010. Uh, working in with Dr. Lumsden, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kleiman, and the likes of Dr. Reardon. So I've learned a lot, and uh, this is kind of my, sort of my homecoming. So as of, uh, until uh, end of last year, I've been working for Siemens as a research scientist, and now I kind of like uh, exploring my hands on some startups and uh, making devices for structural heart interventions. And I also doing some imaging uh, consulting work. So uh, it's kind of my homecoming. And thanks again, Dr. Q and Dr. Lumsden for giving me this opportunity to think about aortic imaging for uh, after quite some uh, break. So let me start. As Dr. Q said, uh, I kind of wanted to uh, throw in a few images and set the stage and give teasers for people to kind of like go back into the journal. And the topic, uh, I hope you all can see my slides. The topic that I'm um, going to briefly touch today is, uh, is about dynamic imaging of aortic pathologies. So I'm, I'm grateful to work with this uh, a multidisciplinary team and our research fellows who have put 
a lot of these work together into manuscripts and Dr. Shah and Dr. Chang for a lot of our discussions on CT and MR imaging. So without further ado, I wanted to start with my talk with why. Why do dynamic imaging? And we have been doing regular CTs and regular MR for quite some time. So uh, at least in my mind, when I sat back and like really uh, internalized it, it's, it's all about uh, finding the right modality, imaging modality for the right pathology. So aortic pathologies by far are very dynamic in nature uh, due to cardiac motion. And if you take dissections, there is a lot of dynamics there. And also we want to make sure how our progress in imaging technologies with faster image acquisition and the, the thought of giving somebody 80 or 100 pieces of contrast and just taking one picture does not uh, really resonate well when it comes to these complex disease pathologies where we want to really make a precise diagnosis and also do almost half of the interventional planning uh, even before the patient is in the OR or in the interventional suite. So I kind of want to start with this slide that I got from Dr. Joe Bavaria. So what you're seeing on the right is the ascending aortic aneurysm with a, a dissected aortic wall. And that shows, I'm sorry about that, that shows how the blood blood is kind of like circulating within the intraluminal, uh, uh, within the wall. And the, the, what we see with imaging is just shadows. What you're seeing here is just the same aortic wall, not in that same patient, but a different patient showing how much of a dynamic disease process we are talking about. So, and when it comes to MR imaging, we can also do a decent uh, imaging, especially when it comes to dynamic imaging. But the time acquisition with MR is we are still kind of like at, in the minutes range and not in the seconds range when it comes to acquiring three-dimensional information. So I'm just gonna go through where else these, uh, like show some examples and then go to some imaging uh, technical protocols of how we do these. So everybody else, anywhere else in, uh, and most of what I'm showing is non-research, everything is commercially available. So if somebody wants to adopt our protocol, uh, they can very easily read our papers and also reach out to us if they have any questions. So, and this is an example of an intramural hematoma where we, we could clearly rule out there is no type 1A endoleak. And most of what we see here is bleeding inside the aortic wall. And that's what you see really well in this candy cane view. And uh, it, this is kind of a radiological sign that uh, that is very well known, like as a sword sign, uh, where you see all these intercostals and all these like tiny little blood pools that you are kind of seeing accumulating in the aortic wall. And uh, and this is one of the videos that from uh, that I've kind of like put, took from our website where. Uh, aortic endoleak is one of the still Achilles heel of EVAR where we still have patients undergo so many multi re interventions and still in some patients we have to bite the bullet and get the graft out and do an open surgical repair and that's kind of what you, the example you're seeing on the left and this is an example of a snorkel EVAR that was done with coil embolizations and you can clearly see a type 1 endoleak that's filling the sac and then washing out into the IMA. So if you do a conventional CT with one time point, you might just have one picture depending on what time point you are acquiring. And then you might think it's a type two endoleak, but uh, the real treatment uh, really starts when we map out these target vessels. Look, so here, this is a case where an uh, iliolumbar vessel is enhancing and you can see even the flow pattern within the aneurysm sac even with our uh, dynamic CT imaging. So there is a lot of terminology we throw around as imagers. I just kind of wanted to simplify it in three things that I wanted to address. Conventional CT, as I assume everybody knows about it, EKG gated CTs and dynamic CTs. So in conventional CTs, what we do is just put these region of interest. If you want to do a PE protocol, you put a region of interest in the uh, PA bifurcation. And if it hits a particular Hansfield unit, which is the CT intensities, say in this case 60 or 80 or 100, there is uh, not a unified protocol across multiple hospitals. So you start by, okay, you trigger your scan when the ascending aorta reaches 100. And that gives you arterial phase or aortic phase. And that's kind of what is conventionally done. And this is a patient with a type B dissection and you can kind of see the septum, but what you're seeing is not two septum, it's basically a motion artifact from a non-gated uh, CT. 
So we, with this, we, it's very hard to know where the fenestrations are or which one is artifact. And there is a lot of publications on how uh, the challenges with conventional single phase CT imaging. So why do this? So latest generations are much faster. What you are seeing here is what is happening inside a CT scan gantry, how quickly the, the source and the detector. So if I pause for a second, so this is an X-ray tube and that's the detector. So this is a dual source uh, scanner. This is the second X-ray tube and the second detector and how fast we can collect data. So why why this is helpful? So if you, if you have an EKG signal as well, then you can collect all this data in conjunction with EKG signal and uh, really get a good sense of, like especially if you're talking about mitral valve or aortic valves or even in coronaries, you can really get a good visualization of these uh, structures uh, at the diastolic phase. And this is a picture showing at 10%, there is still cardiac motion, but at 70% of cardiac RR interval, where it, during diastole, you are literally freezing the heart and doing the imaging. And where, where else can we go with this? So there are much better uh, temporal resolution and lower radiation protocols where you can really program the scanner to acquire the scans purely in diastole. So that's called prospective EKG gating. So I've, I've introduced two concepts. I know I'm going fast. One is conventional CT imaging and EKG gated CT. So why does, why or how does this dynamic imaging fit into these two protocols that we have already known for quite long? So this is, when you are looking at these time attenuation curve, this is what we see. So number one, the first one, the, the earlier peak is from the pulmonary artery and the one and two are from the aorta. So instead of just doing one scan, we take multiple scans so why? Because we wanted to maximize this contrast bolus that we have given and understand the dynamics of this contrast enhancement in three-dimensional way. We Today, as we speak, we can get that with angiography in terms of 2D angiography, but we wanted to understand this in three-dimensional way. This is helpful for treatment planning and appropriate graft sizing and uh, even uh, surgical planning. So this is, imagine this is your conventional uh, time attenuation curve, and you can kind of see the contrast enhancement in the right side of the heart. And then as it washes out, we collect roughly eight to 10 time points along these curves. And we can also play around with where we wanted to have the most number of scans. So in type one end release, we tend to have more scans in the earlier part of the curve, whereas in type two end release, where we know that it is gonna be delayed enhancement, we tend to have our scans and the cycle times to be uh, more towards the end. So this, so these are different means we can uh, reduce the radiation and still get the dynamic information from the same amount of contrast that we are injecting to the patients. This is just a video of our acquisition. The contrast is injected from this injector. And this is from what we call as a shuttle mode. As we are injecting contrast, the, the table moves in and out and we define a specific region of interest, focusing on the pathology that the patient has based on, most often we have preoperative images, even with echo or other angiographic modalities, we know exactly where the problem is and we focus our radiation on that region of interest with the same amount of contrast agent. So once we do this, now we have uh, what we call as post-processing, and this is what Dr. Lumsden was alluding to. Most people have the tools but to kind of like get, make sense of all this enriched data that we have and show it to the surgeons or the interventionalists to do the right treatment during the OR, that's a, an art in itself. And that's kind of where I had the pleasure of working on site here at Houston Methodist for close to 10 or 13 years. And now you can really understand what is happening in the true lumen and when the false lumen is enhancing when the true lumen is enhancing and where the individual administrations are. And this really is helpful with planning our uh, interventional therapies. And I just kind of wanted to wrap up with uh, one of our papers that I would refer to. So now what this is doing is, this is from one of the cases that I have done with Dr. Atkins, who is on the, on the uh, panel here today. So where we had a, a patient with type A dissection, which was uh, who was treated by uh, aortic cuffs from Gore, because we didn't have access to a dedicated type A uh, dissection device yet. 
So after the uh, deployment of the device, we were able to clearly map out the endo leak was coming from the proximal end of the strength graft, which is more closer to the sinus of Alsawa. And so switching gears to MRA, so we can also get the same amount of information from MRA. The good thing with MRA is there is no radiation. You can scan them as long as you want. So this is an example of a shoulder AVM that was scanned with uh, uh, MRA, gated MRA sequence, which shows the lesion and all the feeders. So once we have mapped out, and you can see us mapping all the individual branches, and you will see them on in the fluoroscopy as a guidance. So in addition to not just so imaging has moved on from just getting a report to now we are using them for as a roadmap for intervention. So this really takes uh, mo makes even more a stronger case for making the right uh, scan and getting the right information as we can as as, as much as possible from the diagnostic uh, imaging before the patient even gets to the OR. So when the patient is in the OR, we are doing only focused treatments and not doing any diagnostic. Uh, uh, tests when the patient is in the OR. That makes a better utilization of the OR time and the resources we have. So, and, and I want to wrap up with, we also have some protocols where we do ferroheme in addition to, in, instead of gadolinium in patients with renal failure. So we can get time resolved information in this patient with type B dissection. You can clearly see uh, where the true lumen is filling and you can see where the false lumen is filling. And also this kind of information, it's almost like a CT scan where you can do your multiplanar reconstructions and get the sizing for stent grafts and stuff. So I wanna wrap up with, so moving from dynamic, what's in the future? So we can also get uh, flow information from MRI with phase contrast imaging in three dimensional space. We can really map out where the maximum wall shear stress and the velocity in the true and the false lumen. So here in this picture, you're seeing the true lumen and the helical pattern of flow in the false lumen. So there are so many therapies that are out there for uh, improving false lumen uh, uh, thrombosis or uh, false lumen embolization strategies. So in summary, uh, dynamic imaging techniques such as CT or MRA or including 4D flow MRIs have enable us to better understand 3D and time resolved fashion uh, assessment of aortic pathologies but I kind of wanted to still put this as a challenge. There's still, at least in my opinion, there still exists a huge gap between conventional radiological or diagnostic imaging and interventional imaging. And that's kind of what we have highlighted in this paper, uh, how we can make this, bridge this gap by using the same scanners and the same uh, and, and customized protocols for interventional planning. And that can have a huge impact on patient specific therapies and also when these patients come back for follow up we are not putting them through unnecessary interventions if we do the right post operative follow up in these patients thank you so much well thank you ponraj and anybody on the panel wants to ask ponraj any questions please feel free to join in right, let me make one comment first and that was when i was at emory Willis Hurst was the chairman of uh, medicine he he wrote the book the heart and he always used to say when you drink from the well Think of the people who dug the well. You dug this well. Uh, in terms <laughs> of building imaging inside the heart and vascular center, um, we are not completely unique, but pretty well, lucky do. in terms of, tell us a little bit about, because we're we, none of this could have been done without having the imaging under the control of clinicians in the heart and vascular center that we can go to discuss what the problem is and have them help with people like Ponraj give the imaging solution to the problem, not just a picture, you know, of the order. Yeah. Well, thank you for making that comment. Mm -hmm. I think you said it. Um, when imaging is in the hands of clinician, things happen. And, you know, we, we have wonderful colleagues in radiology that helps us a lot. Um, but we have different mindsets. And as clinicians, we have the mindset of decision making for patient care. So um, when we uh, created the, uh, the new era of the uh, heart center, which Dr. Lumsden also <laughs> directs nowadays, uh, you. <laughs> one, one of the things we felt very strongly was that cardiovascular imaging had to be in the hands of clinicians. And uh, we did get a lot of support from the hospital for this concept so that today we have this 
Cardiovascular Imaging Institute that uh, initially was headed by Dr. William Zogby and now is, is headed by uh, Deepan Shah, where all of the modalities come together and they are all run by clinicians. And I think that is what spearheaded all the progress that now we're sharing with you. And, and uh, that's, to me, that's crucial. If any of you are listening and you're in an institution that want to make progress, you have to have clinicians involved. So that's, just, that's to, key. just to kind of explain that a little further for those that aren't part of our uh, hospital system, uh, cardiovascular imaging is housed within the Department of Cardiology uh, and is run by our clinicians. Uh, outside of the Department of Radiology, we have our own CT scanners, MRI scanners, ultrasounds, all the other uh, typical imaging modalities, but it's all run by clinicians, not by radiologists, which is different than any other institution I've ever worked at. Anyone got any questions from Parnaraj? He answered all the questions that I had written down to, uh, to ask him. <coughs> so Parnaraj, uh, you showed the image of the flow into the aorta. It, it was amazing. Before I came here, I used to not pay attention to the heart when I look at a CT scan because it was mm -hmm. dynamic. Now you taught me, and this institution taught me that aorta is just not a pipe. It's, it, it's dynamic. But you showed me the flow into the uh, aortic dissection, but you didn't show the actual aorta, the actual wall. What do you think uh, the effect of aortic wall is on mm -hmm. predicting the future of the aneurysm degeneration or pathology uh, of the future of that uh, aortic disease? <clears throat> okay, so <laughs> that's a great question. So what I have touched in the, in the uh, 4D flow is looking at what is happening in the lumen but we still have a lot of we have gold mines of data but what needs to happen at least in my opinion is how is the wall reacting before and after we put a stent graft for example and in an ascending aorta the, the impact is pretty high right so there is a quite a bit of distensibility in the aortic uh, wall in the ascending aorta so there now that we have all this data in three-dimensional fashions now we need to develop, or there are tools, but they haven't really re, uh, reached the routine clinical practice where we need to have better tracking tools or better uh, 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 evaluation tools of what is the temporal change of the aorta across the cardiac cycle before an intervention. And also if after the patient has gone through an intervention, well, how, that, how did that change and we have to be able to precisely map that to the pre-procedural uh, uh, intervention. So, and that is something that is still a lot of uh, grounds to be uh, covered and explored here. And uh, combining that with what we have with 4D flow imaging, and also now with MRI, we can do uh, wall elasticity measurements. So combining with that, we will be able to answer this question of what is the disease progression in this, uh, uh, in this patient and potentially in the future, we'll be able to predict before the aortic dissection happens. But we, are, uh, we, we have to focus our efforts more towards preventative care and um, mass follow-up of these patients, especially if they have a known genetic or uh, morphological risk factors for uh, aortic dissection, for example. I hope I, I, I touched the answer to your question. You did, yeah. you did. So Dr. Wright, we're 25 minutes into this. And we haven't heard from you yet. That's kind of unusual. I'm sure you've got some comments to make to Ponrad. <laughs> well, no, he actually, you know, he uh, came up to Dallas uh, a couple of years ago and helped he us did? You know, learn how to do the dynamic <laughs> CT. And it's been very helpful in trying to track out these uh, uh, sources of uh, endo leaks. That uh, I've seen him do some presentations in rooms with very capable people who were all betting on a type two endo leak and with the dynamic CT be able to show that this actually was a type one endo leak. It's, uh, it really is, uh, it changes the way you think about these uh, problems. All right, John, since, since, you're, since you're up, why don't we just jump to you since you're our other remote guest. You wrote the chapter or the article on dissections. Is there anything you want to highlight? Mm -hmm. uh, all right, more slides. <laughs> we got you, John. We see them. I think you are muted, Dr. Wright. 
John, we can't hear you. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Better? Oh, much better. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So we have had a change in reporting standards. Uh, Joe Lombardi, who ran one of the Cook trials for the endographs, uh, wrote an article about three or four years ago, kind of at least trying to define some language that we can all agree on. And probably the time, the, the chronicity is probably important. This hyperacute now is used to describe these less than 24 hour dissections, acute one to 14 days, subacute 15 to 90, and chronic greater than 90. And then I think uh, this next slide shows the uh, classification systems where you can see the uh, old DeBakey and Stanford classification systems and the new system that uses this sort of point system where any dissection that occurs in the ascending aorta, uh, we call an A, if the tear is in the descending aorta, call it a B, and it sort of moves it all the way across the arch. I have one slight variance with this in that we tend to think of our type A's really is what's intrapericardial. I'm not sure that it's as important to differentiate what occurs around the innominate artery when it's uh, outside the pericardium. What I care about is whether I'm gonna have aortic insufficiency or interruption of coronary blood flow. Whereas anything that's outside the pericardium, really we, would, we kind of think of as a type B dissection. And I think the, the classification system is it's close to that, but it, this area around the innominate is still a little fuzzy in terms of uh, how we think about it. The, uh, so in general, what's not new is that we think of uncomplicated type B dissections, meaning there's no sign of bleeding, rupture, or hemorrhage, and there's no sign of clinical malperfusion, mostly to a visceral artery or to an extremity. These high risk features seem to multiply almost every day and actually probably represent the reasons that we intervene more frequently than any other. And those would be a total aortic diameter greater than 40 millimeters. So these people who come in the door with large aortas uh, who don't have malperfusion and who do not have any sign of rupture, we would still generally uh, recommend early treatment to try to prevent the downstream uh, problem of aneurysmal degeneration. True lumen diameter greater than 22 millimeters measured in the short axis. Radiographic malperfusion, so for instance, if you lost a kidney on CT scan, uh, we would probably treat that as a, as a high risk feature of an acute presentation and recommend treatment. Hemothorax obviously would be a treatment readmission I'm not exactly sure why readmission. I think it kind of comes under the heading of if you, if you give me a headache, I'll give you a headache. That, that if, if you bounced back once, then you're probably going to get treated. And it's often because of a failure of uh, blood pressure control. The definition of refractory is, I'm not clear that it's actually defined. We kind of tend to say, uh, if you came in on a Friday and you're still hypertensive on a Monday, that's refractory. In the middle of the week, I'm thinking our, our definition of refractory is not quite as defined, uh, but it, it means that you've made a serious effort to get blood pressure under control and, and not able to do it, presumably related to renal uh, malperfusion. Uh, and the same is true with refractory pain. It, it, one of the things that surprised me most about watching type B dissections is the potentially the close association between the actual blood pressure and symptoms that patients present. I've seen people on more than one occasion who had quite significant chest pain and a blood pressure of 130. And when you got them to 110, the pain went away. And that they could tell you uh, what their blood pressure was based on the severity of the symptoms they were having. And we, we emphasize that with our residents on call to be pretty aware of uh, what the symptom relationship is to the actual blood pressure. The, uh, it's not surprising that the predictors of mortality, mesenteric ischemia is just the worst thing. When people come in the door with mesenteric ischemia, particularly in the type A dissections, we've had a hard time figuring out what to do with these people. Um, our cardiac surgeons naturally are very hesitant to operate on somebody with a tender abdomen. Uh, because by the time you get the dissection fixed, the bowel may have died. And yet we're concerned about putting an endograft into a dissected aorta 
even if we think the tear is in the descending uh, segment uh, with retrograde flow, uh, because of the fears that it may induce some, you know, immediate cardiac effect, uh, particularly tamponade. Uh, but that's what we've tended to do lately. That is, if somebody comes in the door with an acute abdomen, clearly acidotic, they've got mesoteric ischemia with a type A dissection, we've been putting in endografts to try to improve blood flow through the visceral segment and then go straight to cardiac surgery as opposed to the opposite, which has not been very successful in our hands. Um, let me go on to the next slide here. And I wanted to just touch base. There's, there's some language that's floated around a little bit over the last few years. And I, I know our, our residents have certainly been confused by it. And I have too. There's a technique called Knickerbocker. The Knickerbocker technique was, was in, so named because it sort of represents these baggy pants. And the idea, if you look in column A, you've got a typical aortic dissection with the arrow showing blood through the tear in the proximal descending thoracic aorta. And if you put a stent graft in, you cover the proximal tear, but you still have retrograde flow here at the bottom of the screen up through the, uh, in B, up through the distal reperfusion point. I quite commonly, when I try to describe this to a patient, I've tried a lot of different analogies. And the best one that I've been able to describe is, imagine uh, a sheet of wallpaper on the wall. We'll take a box cutter and we'll cut the wallpaper and reach in with your hand and kind of create a little pocket and then take a garden hose and put in behind that pocket and let the water run down the wall and peel the wallpaper off the wall. When the, when the water gets to the baseboard, the pressure builds up and it tears back into the room. You've created a virtual space that didn't exist before. And when I tell patients, we're gonna take duct tape and we're gonna cover that proximal tear, they, they sort of begin to understand what dissection is. Um, it's a hard thing for patients to get a concept of, much less me or my residents. Now, with in C on this picture on the Knickerbocker, there were actually three cases that this initial you described in a situation where they had a ruptured thoracic aorta with bleeding into the chest. And they looked at this thing, we covered the thoracic aorta, we still got bleeding through retrograde flow in the false lumen. And really they just said, well, maybe we can just put in a big graft and just expand it and stop blood flow retrograde. And so Knickerbocker technically is the expansion with a balloon and tearing of the septum within the covered stent to prevent retrograde flow in the false lumen and exsanguination. And it worked on these cases, and it has become a technique that some people have used. The obvious problem with type B dissections is that while we're, we're very good at treating immediate rupture, and we're pretty good at treating malperfusion and restoring flow, what we're not very good at is long-term durability because of the perfusion of the false lumen and the eventual development of, of uh, aneurysmal degeneration in the segments that haven't been treated. So most of the effort over the last few years has been figuring out ways to try to reduce the risk, which may be 30 to 50 percent in patients with even a relatively short period of time, meaning three or four or five years, that the visceral segment becomes aneurysmal, which requires you know, the most complex of aortic treatments. So another technique to try to reduce that risk of early failure uh, is the so-called stable device or stable trial was what was run, but it was using the so-called petticoat or the non-covered visceral segment. So once you cover the proximal tear in order to improve blood flow acutely through the visceral segment, particularly people who have persistent malperfusion after placement of the proximal tear, you could put this bare metal stent. And it's the concept is good, but it, it hasn't uh, resulted particularly in uh, remodeling of the false loom as effectively as I think everyone would have preferred. And this is just a picture of a, a situation where you have a T-var and a petticoat and how there's such a significant reflow in the false lumen. And similarly here down by the celiac artery. Now the stabilized technique is a little more hair raising adventure. I don't know uh, to the extent that you've uh, done this, but the concept is to uh, put in the proximal covered stent, extend through the visceral segment with a bare stent, and then take a balloon and expand the, um, expand the, true lumen to, to essentially tear the septum. Uh, this is um, a little better illustrated here. So you put on the 
proximal graft, extend through the visceral segment, and then take a balloon. And just like the knickerbocker, you initially tear within the covered stent. Uh, then extending through the uncovered stent, you can continue this process of balloon expansion to essentially create a single lumen of aorta rather than dual lumen. I will show you uh, the difference in the long-term result is that acutely on the left, you can see a lot of residual flow in the false lumen. In the right is a selected sample where you basically eliminated the true and false lumens by essentially rupturing the septum. That sounds like a good idea. <clears throat> there haven't, there's been very few reported cases of aortic rupture. There's one in the, in the, from China that was salvaged with an aortic endograft. I suspect most people, if they do rupture it, they wouldn't report it. This is a side-by-side a -side picture. I'm gonna see if this little video will run. So here we're, we're kind of sequentially working our way down with a compliant balloon. And I'll put a star, now watch the balloon pop. That's where it popped. And you can feel this in your syringe in your hand when it pops. And the first couple of ones that we did, when you feel that pop, you immediately look to the blood pressure to see how is everything still going okay. Clearly, we need a more controlled method of rupturing or cutting this septum. Now, I will say there are there's a, 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 a Italian surgeon has uh, talked about trying to do a, a trial of this, and they recommend not ballooning proximal landing zone. You balloon in the in the descending thoracic aorta in the covered stent first, use the latex or compliant balloon only in the covered segment, then they recommend, which we haven't done as, as accurately, is use the uh, a balloon with a defined diameter, clearly not larger than the total aortic diameter through the visceral segment. And the, we have not lost visceral branches when we've done this, uh, but some, as I say, you might put, it's conceivable that you would want to put safety wires out the visceral artery so that when this relamination occurs, that you'd have a pretty good chance that the, uh, uh, that you will not have lost a visceral branch when you cut the septum. Uh, I will say, uh, Carlos Timuron over at Southwestern in Dallas has been interested in a similar concept, that is to get rid of the septum, but has done so using an electric wire, basically, where they shave off a, a, the mid an insulation in a wire, put two catheters up in the true and false lumen, and then withdraw this after it's been uh, uh, electrified and essentially cauterize a slice through the septum. It, again, similar concept to the stabilized technique is to create a single lumen of aorta without a false and a true lumen. The goal is to create a single lumen, at least down to the infrarenal aorta, so that if you get aneurysm degeneration in the, in the infrarenal segment, you have a fairly straightforward treatment with a conventional endograft. So those were, there's a lot of other things we talked about in the chapter, but those are just some things that I found interesting in that, uh, again, while we do a pretty good job with type B dissections acutely, it's the long-term follow-up and the long-term degeneration failure of the acute treatment is really where our Achilles heel is. Thank you. Thanks, John. Any questions for him? Mm. No. One, one thing I was just going to say is uh, kind of a shout-out here to our uh, friend uh, Faras Musa has gotten a, uh, a grant from the National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute to look at uncomplicated type B aortic dissection in the United States. Uh, and I think uh, there's going to be some international sites as well. But uh, that trial should hopefully be starting uh, within the next 6 to 12 months, uh, recruiting sites now. Uh, reach out to him if you're interested. So really, that's the, the unquestion that we don't know is, is early TVAR and uncomplicated type B aortic dissection uh, with positive aortic remodeling going to benefit these patients down the road, which we think so, but we don't know. Yeah. It's exciting times for type B dissections. So John, you got a 67-year-old man, type B dissection, uncomplicated. What do you guys do? You know, it kind of depends on who's on call. Honestly, <laughs> we, we flip a coin. Uh, some of them we cover, some of them we don't. And we don't know what's the right answer. We're not participating in randomized trial. I think we should be. Uh, you know, it, it, I think most people's care is mostly governed by what their most recent disaster was. And the disaster in this procedure would be paraplegia. 
So when you take an asymptomatic or, you know, a, a controlled blood pressure controlled type B dissection in an otherwise functional uh, person and put in a stent graft and wind up with a uh, paraplegia, that curbs your enthusiasm uh, when you see the next one. Admittedly, the, the risk is low, but I actually, we had one that occurred in Greenville when I was there and a guy that had about, we only had to put a little 10 centimeter mm-hmm. proximal uh, stent graft in. Wow. And he wound up uh, paraplegic. He recovered to some degree, but he still had significant weakness even when he walked out of the hospital a couple of weeks later. So it just, uh, you know, it curbs your enthusiasm. You just have to be thoughtful that uh, with good blood pressure control and, uh, you know, uh, with, you know, especially if you have a very extensive dissection that you're not likely to cure with an endograft initially. Now, if you could cover the whole thing in the proximal thoracic aorta, we'd be more aggressive probably about treating that. All right. Shall we move on? Sure. Marvin, I think you're next up. You had a couple of uh, articles in here. I actually sure. shared them with your son, who's his first publication as a biomedical engineer, so he's got to be really proud. Yep, very much uh, so. Any, any particular messages in fenestrated graphs or ascending, I think, fascinates everyone? Yeah, so a couple things. I guess, uh, you know, starting off on the branched and fenestrated endographs uh, and also the ascending, we're still very much in the infancy of these devices. Uh, the Cook uh, ZFEN device, which has been out since 2012, really is the only one that's still on the market uh, or has made it to market uh, that's commercially available. We have some thoracic device, branch devices that uh, recently came available this year from Gore, um, but all the other devices are still on clinical trials and they're just very, very slow to come to market. Uh, In the article, we talk a little bit about physician-modified endografts and some of the techniques for that and and how people around the country and around the world are are using that uh, technique in patients that uh, present with acute aortic syndrome and and you don't have the luxury or time to either enroll them in a clinical trial or or, um, uh, order a custom device that takes sometimes four to six weeks to to make for them. Um, So we kind of touch on that in the the article there. Um, But uh, definitely there's some newer devices from all the manufacturers that are coming down the line. Uh, some trials for uh, P branch uh, with Cook. Uh, the Gore Tamby trial should hopefully be finishing and rolling soon. Uh, so there's a lot of branched and fenestrated devices that are on trial that uh, you know hopefully should be coming uh, to market. We hope in the next several years. Um, so it's exciting times for that. Uh, in regards to the ascending aorta, we're really in the infancy. Uh, there's only been one device uh, that's been available. Uh, that was the Agora Rise trial using their ascending stent graft device. Uh, we were uh, Mike Reardon, uh, who's with our group, uh, was the national PI for that device, and um, it, it took six years to enroll 19 patients. Wow. Um, and so uh, there, we've just uh, uh, they've started picking sites for a Rise Two, which is going to be coming out. So a Rise One was for type A, uh, acute type A aortic dissection in high risk patients. Um, there were a lot of inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, there was a, a separate um, uh, compassionate use group that we have uh, that we're uh, working on getting that publication out as well. But of the original uh, patients, it was only 19. And then a lot of patients we screened over the last several years since I started here about five years ago for that trial. Uh, the vast majority that we screened, I got called on most of the dissections to screen them for that. And, uh, most folks have an entry tear that's within two centimeters of the um, uh, highest coronary artery and that would preclude them from mm-hmm. uh, you know, being able to be enrolled in the trial yeah. of the device. And so you know, there's a lot of stuff that um, you know, they're either going to have to ease up on some of the inclusion exclusion criteria, we're going to have to make some improvements in the engineering of these devices, they're going to have to somehow be combined with a, um, uh, a TAVR device uh, to really bring the thing down into the aortic root. Um, you know, it's really exciting times for the ascending aorta. Uh, the Gora Rise 2 trial that will be coming out, they've actually excluded acute type A aortic dissection. So it's going to be for patients that have a penetrating ulcer uh, with intramural hematoma. They have a pseudoaneurysm. Say, for instance, they've had coronary bypass and they have a pseudoaneurysm from a vein graft. Uh, they have an anastomotic aneurysm from a previous ascending repair, or if they have a chronic type A dissection, 
then they can be considered for the um, ARISE 2 trial. Uh, we're expecting an ARISE 3 trial uh, maybe another year uh, after this one gets going, and that will again uh, try and tackle acute type A aortic dissection. Can I ask a question? Please. Uh, type A dissections, typically, the common variety usually requires to go in there and take care of the ascending aorta with the graft. <coughs> Correct. The, the, the simple ones, okay? Um, why would you want to complicate your life with stenting when the surgical treatment seems to work pretty well? I mean, yeah. what's the incentive to get into more complex uh, endovascular procedures? Correct. So I understand it for descending because descending, surgery in the descending aorta, so I've seen it. it. Sure. It's horrible. But the ascending aorta usually is a straightforward, uh, good surgeon. Puts a graph and uh, test it. Yes and no. I'm so talking about uh, no. Yeah. I'm not talking about the arch, and I'm talking about just yeah. So yeah. so just a, an ascending hemi arch repair. Yeah. The mortality rate across the board is still somewhere around 10 percent. So you know most people would consider could even consider that a high risk okay. operation if you had a 10 percent mortality rate. Stroke risk probably somewhere five to 10 percent. Um, you know it just depends on their anatomy, what's dissected. Uh, you know, all these come in different and, varieties. And we think that we can beat that with an endovascular so, procedure? So right now it's really for, supposed to be for patients that would be considered high risk for open repair. Okay. Uh, so again, just like starting out in TAVR, starting right, out in T-VAR, right. it's really going to start out in, in, in high risk patients, uh, refine the techniques. If we get good results, then we can translate it to lower uh, risk populations. Yeah. It, it's pretty challenging enrolling people in a trial when they're coming in emergently and you're measuring mortality in 1% per hour. You know, there's a device that nobody had ever had their hands on before. Yeah. Um, normally you have a coordinator or support. Actually, in the original part of that, the feasibility study, the FDA allowed remote support. I think it was one of the first times this had been done. Mike Nielsen is the engineer with Gore who actually built this. He was up in Seattle supporting the case down here, uh, which is pretty interesting. Pretty yeah. In some series, up to a third of patients are turned down. So the turn down rate for a type A dissection repair can be, in some series, 10 to 30 percent. Uh, essentially, you go see somebody, you say you're just too high risk, and then yeah. you manage them medically, and you know we know what happens in the vast majority of those patients. Tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are at the moment. I mean, you, you and I have talked a lot about this. Well, I think we'd probably find John falling off his seat here when we start talking about <laughs> vascular surgeons who go on to do cardiac. But I mean, I really think this is a, a wave of people who are going to do this. Yeah, so I uh, you know, started out uh, five years of general surgery, uh, did two years of uh, vascular surgery, was fortunate to be able to go to Mass General and work with Rich Cambria during my vascular surgery uh, fellowship, had a really huge thoracic aortic experience, both open and endovascular, and then was kind of back in practice here in Texas, back at home uh, for about 10 years and kind of found that every year the kind of the volume of stuff I was doing aortic-wise was getting less and less. Um, you know, most uh, of these patients kind of find centers of excellence and, uh, you know, it's tough to build those in lesser, or not lesser, but smaller hospital systems. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of found myself trying to do more things around the aortic arch and, and uh, always would kind of criticize folks that would do things that were outside of their wheelhouse that they couldn't uh, fix complications. And here I was, you know, starting to, to move in that direction. And so uh, after uh, several years of uh, hounding my family, I uh, was able to uh, go back and do two years of cardiac at Penn. And, How old were you? Uh, a uh, 43-year-old fellow um, <laughs> at that point, so uh, that was that was tough, uh, masochist. Uh, no. My my midlife Alan, crisis. Uh, it was, was either. Gonna, go ahead, John. I was just going to make a comment about training. That uh, there may be students watching. I don't know, but while it's traditional to go into cardiac surgery from a general surgery five-year training program, you can elect to go into cardiac surgery from an integrated vascular program. Right. And so that really creates the sort of ultimate cardiovascular surgeon with five years of, you know, vascular training followed by two years of cardiac fellowship. Uh, and it's, it's an appealing pathway for people who know they want to do, you know, complex aortic surgery because they really get the, all the imaging. It's hard for, a, you know, a cardiac surgeon to come out of general surgery and pick up all of the kind of endovascular 
uh, challenges in a two-year training program. In the meantime, you're having to do non-cardiothoracic and esophagus and all the rest of what goes on in a, a board-certified cardiac surgeon. So it is something to, to think about. Yeah. I well. would say most people these days going into a cardiac surgery fellowship, they get great open skills. They're doing type A dissections. They're doing open A sending repairs, arch repairs. Uh, their exposure to hands-on endovascular wire catheter skills, probably less so. Yeah. The converse of that in a vascular surgery fellowship these days where so much uh, is endo, uh, the open numbers, you know, I think it's, you know, two to five open abdominal aortic aneurysm repairs in a vascular surgery fellowship these days, which is just crazy. So here's a little fun fact for you, John. We were talking about this just before we came on the air. Uh, you could do five years of vascular, two years cardiac, and be a bona fide cardiovascular surgeon. If you want to be an interventional cardiologist, four years internal medicine, three years of cardiology and then another year takes longer to become an interventional cardiologist than become double boarded in cardiac and vascular surgery. And that's without touching yeah. structural heart. And not, that's, yeah, <laughs> another year another for structural year. heart. <clears throat> Pretty yeah. interesting yeah. when you think about yeah. it from that standpoint. Okay, last but by no means least, we got Dr. Maham Rahimi, MD, PhD, he's an engineer and um, he's been working. I want to know, talk about your models that you've been working on and also basically the, 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 the protocol that you kind of put together. Mm -hmm. If I may promote uh, Jorna first, and then I'll go to the sure. uh, to the models. Uh, I think it's an excellent topic, disease of aorta. Uh, and uh, what what we did for our section was talking about rupture abdominal aortic aneurysm. And why I think is important because protocol are effective way to have a good outcome for patients. And uh, having a good protocol to understand what to do with these patients is the uh, gist of this uh, article. Now, we divided the phases before coming to the hospital and into the hospital. When you are getting the call, the transfer center and calling rupture AAA coming, uh, it's anxiety provoking and uh, not sure what to do, what to ask. Uh, you always say yes, and the patient comes in and the patient has stage four lung cancer and is DNR and DNI. Uh, was that a mistake or was that a right thing to do to evaluate the patient in your own hospital? So the protocol is set to understand what to do, what to ask in efficient manner. Uh, so what we did here was uh, dividing in different phases what to say to transferring hospital uh, in order to understand the patient uh, ability to tolerate any procedure and then uh, calling them five minutes later after the transfer has started in order to get them here safely and give them the uh, in structures as what need to be done for that patient appropriately. For instance, uh, permissive hypotension should be practiced. Once the patient comes to our hospital, we have a rupture AAA timeout, exactly the information we need to know in a few minutes, rather than saying this is a 46-year-old male with a past medical history. These are irrelevant at that point. We need to know permanent information. And what to say to the anesthesiologist, what the nurses need to do, uh, what are exactly the instruments need to, to have in the operating room, and then before the surgeon touched the patient. So basically we went through different phases as what we need to do for each of these phases efficiently in order to have a good outcome. Then we have post-operative phase, uh, early and late. In the early phase, what are the complications that can happen? In the late phase, as how we can follow these patients, when to do their scan, and what's the quality of life after rupture AAA. All this information came in from uh, Rupture AAA textbook from Ben Starnes, Frank Weath, and Mehta, and also personal experience, SVS guideline too. And it basically gives you a guideline as how to manage this patient. Now, as Dr. Atkins says, if, the... If, yes, if sir. I can ask, the proof of the pudding of any protocol is the results. Mm -hmm. So applying all of these protocols that you have uh, so beautifully outlined, and that makes so much sense. What is our current mortality in that setting of an acute rupture? Yeah, I wish I could tell you that. I don't have that information. But it shows that having the protocol in, in other hospitals have decreased by half. Uh, and this is uh, uh, just quoting other papers. Uh, going from 50% mortality in a hospital down to 25%. And uh, most of them, uh, some of them are related to the protocol, some of them are related to the endovascular treatment of rupture abdominal aortic cancer. So it's hard to say which one, which one had the more effect. 
But what I was going to say is what Dr. Atkins said, that the uh, vascular surgeons are uh, more uh, tailored toward doing endovascular procedures, and uh, open procedure uh, is uh, uh, challenging for them to perform. So what we did in the laboratory, we developed a rupture abdominal aortic aneurysm uh, model, cadaveric model, that we can train people to do uh, endovascular treatment and open treatment of these in a very controlled setting. And uh, that's basically the model that yeah, we developed. Very good. All right, well, we're kind of close, almost to the point where we close up, but i got to get Dr. Quinones to tell one story. Ponrash, you probably need to pop some Valium about right now because I'm not <laughs> sure you're going to be able to handle this because we're going to get Dr. Quinones to tell us how eorograms were done here back in the days of Stanley Crawford and DeBakey. Yeah, so when, when I came back, um, I did all my training then. I spent a couple of years in the military. I came back, it was 1977. Um, we got these beautiful aortogram pictures, and lo and behold, they were being obtained by a transluminar um, stick um, from the back. So the patient would be lying on their stomach, and they would be going through the back, very little guidance other than fluoroscopy, and the aorta would be hit, the dye would come in, the pictures were absolutely fantastic, and I never saw a complication. In fact, it took a while to convince the, there was a team of radiologists that only did that, so they were extremely good. It took a while to convince them to go away from that and stick the femoral and do it the, the other way. <laughs> so it's just amazing. Um, the other thing that is fun to talk about is that in those days, the best imaging that we had of the aorta and peripheral vessels were the drawings of Dr. DeBakey. Yeah. 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 He had a pencil and he would do this incredible detailed drawing of that you could get more information from that than from actually seeing a, any of the pictures. So um, yeah, th those were exciting days, no question about it. Back to but you. But here we are now <laughs> with a lot of exciting. This has been a wonderful webcast. You guys have been terrific. I have learned a lot from watching you and I hope that you all uh, in your homes or your offices have also uh, learned, but please, Go to the issue and read some more because there's still more learning to be done. Thank you all for your attention and thank you guys for being here today. Thanks, thank John. Thanks, Ponrash. <laughs>